Hello. So in this topic, we're going to have a look at gene technology. So it's quite a big topic and it sort of looks at the application of DNA in different ways. So the main things we're going to be looking at is genetic engineering, which we'll look at in booklet two, genetic, genetically modified crops and gene therapy, which is two and three, genetic fingerprinting in booklet one, and then the other things in books two and three. Okay, so this booklet is mainly focusing on genetic fingerprinting. Now, there's a couple of things which we'll look at and are sort of interlinked with all of the topics. So to be able to manipulate DNA in different ways, there's different things that we can do. First up is a set of enzymes called restriction endonucleases, and these can be used to cut a particular section of DNA that is of interest. For example, cut out the section of DNA that is the gene for insulin. Useful thing about this is it can then be inserted into bacterial plasmids. Now the thing about these are, like other enzymes, they have specific active sites for certain strands of DNA. We also will look at DNA probes, which are short sections of DNA with a known sequence, and they'll have radioactive labels. So basically what you can do is you can add DNA probes to a section of DNA, mix it together, and see if a certain gene is present. We've then got gel electrophoresis. Now gel electrophoresis is basically like a fancy chromatography. So in this example, you take a section of DNA, you chop it up using the restriction endonucleases and cut it up into many fragments. This will give you loads and loads of fragments of lots of different sizes, which you can then use gel electrophoresis to separate and find the fragments of interest. So we'll look at that in a bit more detail. And this is the basis of how we can get a genetic fingerprint for different organisms. We then look at the PCR or the polymerase chain reaction, which is a method used to copy or amplify very small amounts of DNA to produce larger amounts. You'll have heard of this because this was used in the PCR COVID tests. So let's get into it then. First up is restriction endonucleases. So as I say, these are globular proteins. So because they're enzymes, they're globular proteins. They have an active site and the way they work is they basically try and recognize specific nucleotide sequences in DNA. They originally came from bacteria which used restriction endonucleases to try and destroy the DNA of attacking bacteriophages. So if they had these little enzymes the bacteria could basically chop up the viral DNA and make it smaller and non-infectious. So it was a way that they could protect themselves from viruses. Now, before we go any further, we know that DNA is double-stranded, made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. And it'll have bases in between which are lined up complementary to each other. So if we have an A here, we'll have a T there, A, G, C, T. So it's the job of the restriction endonucleases to recognize specific nucleotide sequences. And we'll have a look down below with that. Now there's many different restriction enzymes produced by different species of bacteria. Each enzyme cuts DNA at a specific base sequence. So this is how each enzyme is specific to its own substrate. It will recognize a specific base sequence known as a recognition site. Sometimes they can make staggered cuts known as sticky ends, and sometimes they'll make flat cuts known as blunt ends. So let's have a little look at the sticky ends. So when the enzymes make the staggered cuts in the DNA, they're called sticky ends. They're called sticky ends because we have these exposed bases. Now, with those exposed bases, they can easily join with another section of DNA if it also has the complementary bases exposed. So that's why they're called sticky ends. 
Now, an example of a restriction endonuclease is ECO-R1, which recognises the sequence GAATTC and cuts each strand between the G and the A. So, GAATTC is the recognition site, which we've mentioned up there. Now, if we have a look here, here we have a section of DNA, and on this section of DNA, we have the sugar phosphate backbone. Here we have the bases all joined up. So, ECOR1 recognizes the sequence GAATTC, and it makes a staggered cut between the G and the A, so it'll separate these bonds as well by breaking the hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs, and it'll chop it there. This leaves us with a sticky end, which is exposed bases. So these here, we would say, are our exposed bases. Now, on the other hand, we have some other enzymes which will make a cut, and this time it'll make a straight cut. So let's time, let's say that the recognition site is GGCC, and this time it makes a cut between the G and the C here, and it leaves blunt ends. These aren't as easy to join together, so we would need to carry out a couple of further processes before we can join sections of DNA produced by blunt ends. Now, next up, restriction enzymes are used in the process of comparing DNA of different individuals. So the restriction enzymes will cut the DNA into a different number of fragments depending on the number of recognition sites in the sample, i.e. if a DNA section has four recognition sites, then five, five fragments are produced. So, let's say for example that this is a section of DNA, and it'll be made up of the sugar phosphate backbone and all the bases. Let's say it recognizes the sequence GAATTC. So anywhere where that sequence appears, it will make a cut. So let's say there's one section, two sections, three sections, four sections. So because there is four sections where there's this recognition site, that means there's going to be four cuts. When it's cut at those places, we'll get five fragments. One, two, three, four, five. So an easy way to work out the number of fragments is the number of fragments is going to be equal to the number of recognition sites plus one. Now, why this is important is because of this. If different people have different DNA and we cut them with the same restriction enzyme, they might have these recognition sites, but they might be in separate places. So by using the same recognition site to cut up different people's DNA, we can compare their DNA together. So what happens is we use the enzymes, we chop up the DNA at the different recognition sites, and then we use gel electrophoresis to separate their fragments by size. Now, next up, the size of the fragments will depend on how far apart the recognition sites are. If two samples of DNA are identical, then treatment with a particular restriction endonuclease will produce the same number of DNA fragments, each of a similar size. So as I say, this can be used in genetic fingerprinting. So because everyone has different DNA with different base sequences, everyone's DNA will have different distances between the recognition sites. So for example, if we compare person one and person two, these are all the places where the recognition sites are, the little yellow parts. So if we used the same enzyme to cut up both our DNAs, their DNA would be different. Now, they'll both still have this little sequence that the enzyme can recognize and cut, but they'll be different distances apart. So for example, this person one will have one, two, three, four fragments. And this person will have one, two, three, four, five fragments. So what we could do is chop up their DNA, use gel electrophoresis, and each person's DNA will produce a unique DNA fingerprint. So that's the basic of restriction endonucleases.
Next up, we're looking at reverse transcriptase. Now, previously we've talked about retroviruses, which store genetic information in the form of RNA, contain enzymes to make DNA from RNA. And the enzyme involved is reverse transcriptase. In gene technology, this enzyme can be used to make the desired section of DNA from the gene's messenger RNA. Now, we have talked about this previously. So we said that in Crick's central dogma for DNA, we could have DNA and it could replicate itself. The DNA could be converted into RNA through the process of transcription. And we could also go this way, which was through the process of reverse transcription. So this is what we're talking about now. And this involves the enzyme reverse transcriptase. So let's say, for example, we start with a section of RNA. We can convert this back into DNA using reverse transcriptase enzymes. Now, the reason why this is useful is, let's say, for example, we wanted to genetically engineer a bacteria to produce a human protein. What we could do is, instead of looking for the DNA for that protein, what we could do is go to a cell where we're likely to find the protein where it's produced, and we could find the gene's RNA, e.g. Say, for example, I wanted to produce human insulin. I know that in all of my cells, I have the same 23 pairs of chromosomes. But the problem is, where do I find the gene for insulin? That's the difficulty. So what I can do instead is, if I went to some pancreas cells, I know that that's where insulin is produced. Now, if insulin is produced in the pancreas cells, I know that there's going to be lots of messenger RNA for insulin in those cells, because those genes are going to be active. So what I can do is find and isolate the messenger RNA, use reverse transcriptase, and that's how I could obtain the gene for insulin. So it's really clever. Okay, so here's what you have to do to be able to use reverse transcriptase to get the DNA of a gene from the RNA. So first up, we've got to isolate and extract the messenger RNA of the desired gene. So it's easier to find the messenger RNA in cells which are more likely to have it. For example, the messenger RNA used to code for insulin is more likely to be present in certain cells of the pancreas. Other cells in the pancreas would be more likely to have messenger RNA coding for the digestive enzymes. Next up, we could use reverse transcriptase to make a single strand of complementary DNA, which is cDNA. In this step, the messenger RNA acts as a template and normal base pairing rules apply. For example, well, sorry, just remember that DNA contains A, T, C, and G, but RNA contains A, U, C, and G. So let's say, for example, we've gone to the pancreas, we found messenger RNA for insulin, and here we have a strand of messenger RNA. And the bases for RNA are this. Okay, now I've just randomly picked these letters. There's nothing special about them other than these are the bases that you find in RNA. We can then use, so we have our little messenger RNA sequence. We use reverse transcriptase and basically what will happen is we'll get a complementary piece of single stranded DNA. So if this starts with A, and because we're talking about the complementary DNA here, the bases are going to change. So if this was an A, its complementary DNA base pair would be a T, A, C, G, A, and T. So basically, we're taking what these bases were in messenger RNA, and we're forming a complementary strand of DNA, which was single-stranded. So, We've got the messenger RNA from the cells. We've taken the messenger RNA and converted it into DNA. And now we're going to take DNA polymerase 
and make the double-stranded DNA from a single strand of copy or complementary DNA. So let's say, for example, we've got this part here. So it was T, A, C, G, A, T. Because of complementary base pairing, and we want to make this DNA double-stranded, this is how we get it. So, from our piece of messenger RNA, we've used reverse transcriptase to get copy or complementary DNA, which was single-stranded. And then through the action of DNA polymerase, we have got DNA, which is double-stranded. So this is now the gene that we were after. So we took the messenger RNA from the gene, we've created a single strand of DNA from that, and then we've created a double strand of DNA, which is the gene. This gene can then be inserted into bacterial plasmid so that the bacteria will be transformed and start producing whatever it was that we were trying to get. So for example, going back to the example of insulin, we get the messenger RNA for insulin from cells in the pancreas, we use reverse transcriptase to convert the messenger RNA into DNA. We then use DNA polymerase to convert the single-stranded DNA into double-stranded DNA. And this double-stranded DNA is now the gene for insulin, ready to be inserted into a bacteria. Now, it's important to check that the correct sequence of DNA is being targeted when using the technique above. And the most common way to check if the desired section of DNA is present is using DNA probes. So, in DNA probes, they're used to identify gene sequences. They can identify whole genes or just short sections of DNA. A DNA probe is a short, single-stranded length of DNA with a known nucleotide sequence. And that is your definition of DNA probe. They're usually marked with a dye, which may be fluorescent or radioactive, so that it can be visually identified. If it's fluorescent, we use UV light to identify it. If it's radioactive, you can use x-rays, which we'll talk about later on. Now, the general principle involves four steps. And this is what goes in your notes. So basically what happens is you take DNA and you heat them. And when you heat them, it breaks the hydrogen bonds between DNA and forms single strands of DNA. You then mix the DNA probe and the DNA in question that you're trying to see if the gene is there for and cool it down. The probe and the DNA will then start to hybridize once you start to cool them. And if there are complementary base sequences, they should join together. The position of the probe and so the targeted gene or sequence is detected. So if we have a little look at this, here we have our DNA probe. Now, as we say, our DNA probe is a short section of DNA. Before we can actually use it a probe, as a probe, it has to be single-stranded and it has to be marked. Okay, so let's say it's marked radioactively here and this is what the little pink upside down lollipops are. So this is now our DNA probe here. We use probes because we know what their sequence is. Okay, so if we know what the sequence for this is, so let's say it's for a genetic disease. This could be the gene, or let's say for example, we're testing somebody's DNA to see if they have cystic fibrosis. So we know it's caused by a gene. So what we could do is, if we know what gene causes cystic fibrosis, we can make a complementary probe for it then you can label it with a radioactive label. We could then take a person's DNA. So let's say that this was a fetus in the uterus. We could get a sample of their DNA. We could denature it, which is basically just heating and breaking the hydrogen bonds. And this makes it single-stranded. We then cool, we mix and cool the DNA probe with the person's single-stranded DNA, and hybridiz hybridization should take place. Now, this only happens 
if we have a complementary base sequence with the person's DNA and the DNA probe. If they don't have a complementary sequence, then no hybridization will take place. So this example shows what would happen if, for example, we had the probe for cystic fibrosis and we had a fatal or we had fatal DNA, which we wanted to test, and they did have cystic fibrosis. They would hybridize and they would be marked. Next up, what we can do is we can use x-rays to detect the DNA. So anywhere where there's hybridization, we can detect it and we can see it in a little banded pattern like this. And this is basically a genetic fingerprint, which we'll get onto later on. Some other examples of DNA probes are these. So this is fluorescent DNA probes. So instead of using radioactive probes, we would have used fluorescent DNA probes. And these ones were detected using UV light. And there are some more examples of it. And this, once again, is what the X-ray probe detection would look like. This is the one that we're going to look at most often. So finally then, uses of DNA probes can be used for genetic fingerprints. So they make the bands on the genetic fingerprint visible, which is what we've just looked at. Genetic engineering. So before a gene can be introduced into the host cell, it must be identified using DNA probes. And as we've already touched on, probes can be used to identify genetic defects. So DNA probes have been prepared that match the sequences of many human genetic diseases, such as muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis. Hundreds of these probes can be stuck onto a glass slide in a grid pattern, forming a DNA microarray. A sample of human DNA is added to the array, and any sequences that match any of the various probes will stick to the array and be labelled, which allows rapid testing for a large number of genetic defects at a time. So we do talk about microarrays later on, but just so it's familiar whenever we get to it, let's say, for example, we have a little glass slide with lots of little wells in it, which can basically hold a sample. Each little one could be used to test for a particular genetic disease. So let's say cystic fibrosis in here, muscular dystrophy in there, and so on and so on. Each one will be coded with a DNA probe, which is stuck on to the inside of the little well. You then take a person's sample of DNA, mix it in, follow like a little experiment procedure, and then use either UV light or an X-ray to try and detect if any have lit up. Now let's say, for example, we're using UV light. Let's say nothing lights up here but then we get a fluorescent color in this one. It shows that this person might be negative for cystic fibrosis, but positive for muscular dystrophy, meaning that they have a gene which is going to cause muscular dystrophy in their lifetime. So this is sort of just extending what we've talked about. So the use of DNA probes to locate a specific DNA sequence. So what we were saying is that the DNA that is expected to have the target sequence is heated to make it single-stranded. The DNA is hydrolyzed into sections using restriction endonucleases. So it's basically chopped up using the enzymes. The DNA fragments are separated by gel electrophoresis, which we're going to look at. And the DNA sections are then transferred to a nylon membrane and the probes are added. So we have all these single-stranded fragments of DNA. We then add the probes. And if the target sequence is present, the probe should join up with the DNA or hybridize. If not, it's washed off and removed. So if we have the probes attached to the matching DNA sequence and we expose it to UV light, the probe should appear as a fluorescent band, which shows the location of the target sequence. Down below just shows you a little example of this. So we have a DNA section. We chop it up using restriction endonucleases, which recognize specific sites or recognition sites. It chops them and the fragments are different lengths. We take all of these fragments and put them into the well down here. We then connect it to electrical current and the fragments move up through the gel. 
You leave that for a little bit of time, transfer the DNA to a nylon membrane, and then expose the nylon membrane to UV light. And if they contain the DNA sequence that we've been after or we've been trying to test to see if they have it, we'll get a fluorescent band. Now, a couple of notes about this, right? So this is about how we use probes to locate a specific sequence. As I mentioned, after you add the probes, which was in this step, any which don't hybridize must be washed off. And that's because they are fluorescently labeled. So if they are left on this nylon membrane, that means that whenever you expose it to UV light, they'll all light up. And that would make you think that they had loads of this copy of DNA. And it would give you invalid results. So that's not what we want to happen. The whole purpose of this is to test to see if somebody has got a particular gene or a particular section of DNA. So we don't want to accidentally think that they do. Basically, all we want to happen is one little band to light up and that'll tell us whether they have it. If there's no lighting up or no sort of visualization taking place here, it means that they don't have that gene present. Next up then, Gel electrophoresis separates the strands based on size, which is why in the diagram above, the GCTT is the second strand from the top. So for example, here we have the longest. This is the next longest. Now, if we count up the bases, we've got seven in this, five, four, and three. You'll notice here how there's one, two, three, four fragments. So this one here is going to be the longest. This is the one with seven bases. This will be the one with five. This will be the one with four. And this will be the one with three. Now what you'll notice is this one. If this has four bases, the GCTT, this would be the complementary probe for it. So let's say, for example, that we've chopped up their DNA and this is the section of DNA that tells us that they've got a genetic disease. They use this probe because that is the probe which would match this gene. So if this is the probe that we want to see or we want to use to see if they've got the gene for disease, that's the probe that we need to use. The probe must be complementary, so the strand they're looking for in this example is GCTT, so the probe must have the sequence CGAA. So next up is the polymerase chain reaction. Now, this is really useful because it means that you, if you start off with a small amount of DNA, you can copy it loads and loads of times to make loads of copies of DNA. So there's loads of uses of this. One of the main uses of this is in crime scenes. So let's say, for example, somebody's been murdered and there's a little splash of blood. What they could do is, scientists could collect that little sample of blood. Now, in that, we basically need there to be some white blood cells. If there's a couple of white blood cells, they'll have a nucleus and we can get somebody's DNA. So let's say there's a tiny, tiny fragment or a tiny, tiny splash of blood at a crime scene. We can take that isolate the DNA from it, enter it into PCR polymerase chain reaction and copy it loads and loads of times. Now, it basically exponentially copies the DNA. So for example, if we start with one little section of DNA, after one cycle, we're gonna get two, another cycle of four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and so on and so on. So in a really short space of time, you can take a very small amount of DNA and get loads and loads of copies of it. Now, for PCR to work, this is what you need. The DNA strand, which is to be amplified. So for example, if we wanted to take, to create lots of copies of the gene for insulin, we could just get a couple of copies of the gene for insulin and we would be able to copy it. But we need to have the DNA at the start. We need DNA primers this time. Now primers are short single length strand, single strand lengths of DNA, which are complementary to the strand which is to be copied. We need free deoxyribonucleotides and DNA polymerase. 
After this, it's literally just a case of heating up the DNA and cooling it down. And as that happens, we'll get lots and lots of copies of the DNA. So, polymerase chain reaction. When there's only small amounts of DNA available, this is where it comes in handy. PCR is used to amplify small amounts of DNA. So amplify basically just means to copy it. Imagine there's been a crime and a tiny sample of blood or sperm has been found at the scene. The PCR could be used to uh, amplify the DNA and match to an individual. It's cheap, reliable and fast. And we need these several things in order to work. So it's these. If you copy this little part into your notes there. So we need the DNA strand, primers, free deoxyribonucleotides, and DNA polymerase. Now, this is the method, and this is the method that we need to know about. So first up, the DNA to be replicated is selected. Now this can be the DNA from crime scene, or another common use of it is a gene that you want to insert into a bacteria. So what you do is you take the DNA fragments and you heat them to 95 degrees. This causes the hydrogen bond to break between the DNA strands. And the two strands of the DNA sample separate. So we started with double-stranded DNA. We heat them, breaks the hydrogen bond, and we get two copies or two strands of DNA. We then add the DNA primers and the mixture is cooled to 53 degrees C. In this step, this allows the DNA primers to join to the complementary bases at either end of the single stranded DNA fragments. So basically what happens is we add the primers in and it'll join up to each end of the DNA. Now the thing about that is it creates a double-stranded section of DNA, now just a very, very short section of double-stranded DNA, because the DNA polymerase cannot work on a single-stranded template. So these primers are basically just a little tiny section of DNA just to help the polymerase get started. The DNA polymerase and free nucleotides are added and the temperature is increased to 73 degrees again. Now, when we go to 73 degrees, the DNA polymerase will start to add on the free deoxyribonucleotides to the single-stranded DNA. And the reason why they join on is because of complementary base pairing. So the A's will join with the T's, C's with the G's, and so on. At the end of this, we have two identical copies of the original DNA which are produced. The steps get repeated, and at the end of each cycle, we have double the number of DNA molecules that we did at the start. So we can do this over and over again until we have loads and loads of DNA. Now, let's look at a bit more detail of this. So here we have our DNA, it's single-stranded, and here we have the primers. One primer for each end of the DNA. So we started off with double-stranded DNA. We heated it to 95 degrees, and that broke it into single strands. We add the primers, which are short lengths of DNA, and they'll join on with complementary base pairing. The reason why we need the primers is because the DNA polymerase, as you can see here, will only work on double-stranded DNA. So once we have our short section of double-stranded DNA, the DNA polymerase can basically go along the DNA, add on the free nucleotides, and start making a big, long, double-stranded version of the original DNA. This diagram again shows it in the same detail. So we have the piece of DNA to be copied, either from the crime scene or the gene that we want to make multiple copies of. We raise the temperature to 95 degrees C, it separates the two strands by breaking the hydrogen bonds. We then add the primers, polymerase, and nucleotides 
Here we can see the primers. We then lower the temperature to 53 degrees C and the primers bind to the DNA. So we have the two sections of the DNA, the green and the orange part, and we have the two primers, one for either end. We then raise the temperature to 73 degrees C and this allows the thermostable polymerase enzyme to replicate the DNA. We repeat the cycle and we'll get loads of copies of DNA. Now you can see if this was the original DNA that we started with, at the end of one cycle we're left with two copies of identical DNA. And we repeat that and we'll get loads and loads of copies of the same DNA. Now, a couple of little questions. Why were the fragments heated to 95 degrees C? That was to break hydrogen bonds between the strands and make the DNA single stranded. It was then cooled to allow the primers to join to the DNA and remember the polymerase needs double stranded DNA or it won't work. The function of the primers is to make the DNA double stranded for the polymerase and two primers might be needed one for each strand of DNA because at either end of it they might not have the complementary base pairs. Now it's important to ensure that the sample is not contaminated with DNA other than the section to be amplified because PCR is non-selective i.e. it will copy any DNA in the sample, not just the one that we're after. There's no way for this to choose or select which DNA it copies. It just copies absolutely every DNA which is in the sample. Finally then, PCR uses high temperatures. However, if normal DNA polymerase would be denatured at high temperatures, what type of enzyme must be used and why is it more suitable than normal DNA polymerase? We have to use thermostable polymerase. This means it works at high temperatures without being denatured. As well as that, the higher temperatures allow a faster rate of PCR to take place. So we can get lots of copies of DNA very quickly. Now, if we start with one copy of the DNA at the start, how many copies of DNA would there be at the end of six cycles? So let's do it. One. There's one cycle. Two. Four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. We need a sixth cycle. Sixty-four copies of the DNA. And it's just doubling each time. Uses of PCR then. So we've got DNA fingerprinting. If there's DNA found in a tiny sample of blood, semen, or a hair root, it can be multiplied to provide a sufficient sample to allow genetic fingerprinting to take place. So we'll have a look at that next. It can be used in genetic engineering. So the gene for the required protein is identified and isolated, like we talked about with DNA probes. It's then multiplied in the polymerase chain reaction to produce many copies. These copies are then introduced into host cells such as bacteria. The bacteria then start to produce the desired protein. Protein is then collected, purified, and used to treat patients. For example, 
insulin is used to treat diabetics. So PCR is basically once we get the gene, we can multiply it over and over again so that we have enough of the gene to insert it into bacteria. We can use it in embryo screening. So a few cells may be removed from an embryo, a very, very young embryo. The DNA can be isolated in the cells. It can be multiplied by PCR and then analyzed for genetic disorders. Healthy embryos can be placed in the uterus immediately or frozen for later on, but unhealthy embryos can be destroyed. DNA sequences, so the exact sequence of bases is identified so as to build up a map of the DNA. And the Human Genome Project is using this technique to map out the entire human genetic code. Now by far the biggest use of PCR that we're going to look at is this, DNA fingerprinting. Okay, so finally then on PCR, a couple of uses that we've already talked about here. So first up, we've got use of PCR at crime scenes. So if there's a small sample of blood or a small sample of DNA, we can extract that, use PCR to amplify it, and then we can carry out genetic fingerprinting. The amniocentesis test. So this is basically where a needle is used to remove amniotic fluid, and this should contain fetal cells. And then basically with the fetal cells, you can extract the DNA from them, amplify it, and use it to check and see if the fetus has any genetic diseases before it's born. And you can also do this very, very early on in pregnancy. It can also be used to create several copies of a particular gene. So for example, we can take the gene from a cell. Once we've got the gene, we can amplify it to make lots and lots of copies of it and insert it into lots of bacteria. The polymerase chain reaction is a method for making many copies of a specific segment of DNA, starting with a very small amount. This technique can be used to identify specific microorganisms from a small amount of DNA and to identify persons involved in crimes from DNA on cigarettes or in a single hair follicle. The DNA to be amplified is mixed with deoxyribonucleotides, a thermal stable DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase, and DNA primers. The DNA primers hybridize to the ends of the gene to be amplified and provide a starting point for the TAC polymerase. The mixture is heated to break the hydrogen bonds in the DNA, forming single-stranded molecules. The mixture is then cooled sufficiently to allow the DNA primers to anneal to each end of the segment to be copied. TAC polymerase then synthesizes the complementary strand of DNA using the primer as the starting point. The temperature is raised again to separate the DNA strands and then lowered sufficiently to allow the primers to attach. TAC polymerase now synthesizes another set of new complementary strands. This process is repeated until enough DNA has been produced to be identified or used for further research. After 21 cycles, one molecule of DNA can be amplified to over a million copies. This amount of amplification can be achieved by running the reaction overnight in a thermal cycler, an instrument that automatically raises and lowers the temperature at appropriate time intervals. The so the last part of this topic then is using nucleotide sequences and genetic markers. So basically we can identify nucleotide sequences using gene sequencing and genetic markers. So basically, a lot of the DNA technology that we currently use involves DNA acting as markers. An obvious example of this is where DNA is associated with a particular genetic disease. The identification of a particular section of DNA will identify that someone has a particular disease. So for example, if we know that, let's say for the sake of argument, GATC, GAT, ATA, is the sequence for a disease, like let's say for example cystic fibrosis, basically means if somebody has a sequence, they have that disease. So this sequence of DNA 
acts as a marker for a particular disease. Now, there's two types. First up is microsatellite repeat sequences, or MRSs. So only 2% of our DNA codes for protein synthesis, 3% has a regulatory role. So we could talk about that as being start and stop sequences. And the rest, 95% has an unknown or undiscovered role. Now, that doesn't mean it's useless. We just aren't fully understanding the uses of it at the minute. Now, the non-coding DNA has lots of sections where they have repeating sequences. There are usually very short repeating sequences between two to six nucleotides in length dispersed throughout a person's DNA. For example, ATCAT -AT is repeated over and over again. So the repeating sequence here is ATC, 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 ATC. The different number of repeats between individuals creates the variation. So this is basically where genetic fingerprint for genetic fingerprinting is based on. So let's say for example, me, my sequences might be ATC, 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 okay? Whereas somebody else, like my brother, his repeating sequence might be ATCG, ATCG, over and over again. And it's these repeating sequences that are unique depending on who you are, and that's what gives us the differences. Because if you think about it, with this 2% of our DNA that codes for our proteins, a lot of, our, a lot of that 2% will be the same because we'll all have genes which produce proteins in skin, genes which produce enzymes for respiration, genes which produce enzymes for all sorts of other things. So it's this other 95%, which is the important part for distinguishing between individuals. Now next up then, we have single nucleotide polymorphisms. So long story short, this is basically when there's one change in a single nucleotide out of an entire gene. Now these variations occur when a single nucleotide in the genome differs between members of a species. For example, two sequence DNA fragments from different individuals, AAGCTA to AAGCTTA, where basically this one here is the only change. So the only difference between that is a single nucleotide. Now, even though this is one nucleotide, it may still indicate the cause of a genetic disease. For example, a single nucleotide change in the gene for the production of haemoglobin can cause sickle cell anemia. As we know from a previous book, it's only one nucleotide change, but that has the effect of changing the amino acid, which has the effect of changing polypeptide structure, well, sequence, and then as a result, it changes its structure. So before we get into genetic fingerprinting, here is just some ways which people and their DNA can vary. Now, when we're looking at genetic fingerprinting, these microsatellite repeat sequences is the important part. And because of these variation in their little repeating sequences, this is what brings us on to genetic fingerprinting. So, as we say, everything we've looked at so far in this topic has a role to play in genetic fingerprinting. And the process involves this. The DNA is extracted from a sample, so it could be from a crime scene or from the cells of living or dead organisms. And the cell must contain the nucleus so that it contains DNA. So this is why we can't use red blood cells because they don't have a nucleus. The DNA is cut into fragments using restriction endonucleases, and the DNA fragments are separated based on size using gel electrophoresis. Now, once they've been separated, the DNA is treated to make it single-stranded, 
the DNA fragments are mixed and labelled with DNA probes. Any probes that aren't complementary get washed off. The DNA is then added to an x-ray film and appears as a pattern of bars and that's the genetic fingerprint. So we basically have to get the DNA, we chop it into fragments using restriction endonucleases, they separate it based on their size using gel electrophoresis, they're made single stranded and then we mix probes. Any probes which don't bind get washed off and finally we develop it using an x-ray film and we get a banded pattern. So down below here's what we've got. We have the restriction endonucleases cut up the DNA and in there we talked about recognition sites and all that sort of stuff. The DNA fragments were separated by electrophoresis so that was by size. The DNA is treated to make it single stranded so sometimes it can be heated sometimes a chemical can be used. The DNA fragments are transferred to a membrane and then the membrane is treated with the DNA probes. So because we've made it single stranded here and we know the probes are short single stranded lengths of DNA, they get added to the DNA which is now on the nylon. If they bind together, we can basically place this under an x-ray film and we'll get a banded pattern like this. So we've combined the enzymes, electrophoresis, probes and this development. Now, a couple of notes about this. Gel electrophoresis is separates the DNA fragments based on the size of the fragments. The smaller the fragments are, the further they travel through the gel. Each band represents a cluster of DNA fragments similar in length. So for example, imagine we get somebody's DNA we chop it up with restriction endonucleases and place it in a well and this is where it starts. We connect up this little gel to an electrical current and the DNA starts weaving its way through the gel. The fragments separate out based on size. So any long fragments stay here, they don't travel very far. Shorter fragments travel up and they travel the furthest distance. So we're separating the DNA fragments based on size. The probes are complementary to the fragments of DNA. So if a fragment had the base code GTAA, the probe would have the base code CATT. And that's what we're sort of showing here. Like let's say for example, if this is the fragment of DNA and we are C A T T, the probe must be complementary to it. The probes are single strands of DNA, therefore, they will only join and other label other single strands of DNA. So, it's important to treat the DNA to ensure it is split into single stranded molecules. The probes can be fluorescently labelled or radioactively labelled. If it's radioactive, the membrane will be exposed to x-ray film. And if it's fluorescently labelled, UV light will be used instead. Now the next little part in your notes is the extraction of DNA. We actually don't need to know this because this would be practical work. So this would be for unit 3. But we do need to know this, the role of the genetic fingerprinting in society. So we can use it in criminal investigations. So let's say we have blood at a crime scene. Oh, it'd be good if I could spell scene. So blood at the crime scene, we use PCR and we amplify the DNA. Next up, let's say for example you have a suspect You've got to take a DNA sample from them, carry out genetic fingerprinting. So use gel electrophoresis and produce a fingerprint. You then produce a fingerprint of the crime scene sample and you compare them.
Now, let's say for example, we produce a fingerprint like this. So this might be the crime scene sample. This might be suspect one. And this might be suspect two. So what we can see here is that the person that committed the crime, or at least whose DNA it is at the scene, must have been suspect too, because all of those bands match up. It wasn't suspect one, because if we look carefully at those, they don't match up, apart from that one. But one isn't enough to show that they were at the crime scene or it's their DNA. We need to have all the patch, all the bands matching up to prove that it was somebody. We can also do this for paternal determination tests. So in this example, here we have a mother and a father fish, a guppy, and here's the baby. So this is our little piece of gel. We would have taken out their DNA, treated it with restriction endonucleases, and implanted it into these little wells here. You then connect it to an electrical current and the DNA moves up through it and we get a banded pattern like this. Now as we can see here, longer fragments are near the start, shorter fragments move the furthest away. Now in this one, we can tell that this is the proper mother and proper father because when we look at the baby's DNA, they have, the baby has bands which match the father and bands which match the mother. If it wasn't their baby, it wouldn't match up at all. Another example here shows how this can be used, a genetic fingerprint can be used to establish evolutionary relationship between species. So here we have species X, Y, and Z. They're all black, they all have a beak. So we can use this to try and work out how closely related different species are. So if we look at species X, we can see it has quite a number of bands which match up. Now because species X has the most number of bands matching species Y, this tells us that species X and Z are very closely related. Now there is a few which species Y has unique. So this is what tells us that it's basically the least commonly related to them. Because species X and Z have so many that match up, it tells us that X is more closely related to Z than Y. Okay, now they do have some that match up, but we're basically looking to see how many of them match up. And we can see that way more match up between X and Z than Y and Z or X and Y. Now, other uses is tissue typing for transplants. So basically, if somebody needed a new kidney, we could use genetic fingerprint to see how closely their DNA matches. Rather grimly, you could also use this to identify victims from catastrophes. So say, for example, you had found a body part which had been had some of its limbs removed. You could basically use genetic fingerprinting to work out who the limbs belong to. Now, the reason why it's useful for these applications is because everyone has a unique genetic fingerprint, except for twins, obviously. And that's because everyone has a different DNA base sequence. When comparing species, the general principle is that the more similar the pattern is, the more closely related the species is. I.e., a red panda and a raccoon are closely related, so they would actually have a more similar fingerprint compared to each other than that of a grizzly bear. Even though pandas are thought of as bears and stuff, the red panda 
is a closer relation to a raccoon than it is to an actual grizzly bear. Everyone's DNA is unique because of the fact that everyone has a unique number of microsatellite repeat sequences. The sequence may be the same in two people's DNA, but the number of repeats will be different. So person one could have ATC, and this is repeated one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yep. And this person has obviously got way more. So it's not only to do with what the sequence is. So like I was saying up here, it could be a different sequence. It's also to do with how many times it's actually repeated. Now, obviously this raises ethical issues, talking about DNA, fingerprinting, and all that sort of stuff, which we'll talk about more in the following booklets. Now, before we go on, it's probably worth having a look at some of these questions just so we're clear on it. So there's quite a few wee questions about these, but I think one which is difficult to do is these ones. So the results of a DNA fingerprint can be used as evidence to link a suspect with a crime. The DNA fingerprint shows the bands obtained from DNA on a hair found at the crime scene, along with those obtained from the DNA of the three different suspects. So this is our hair at the crime scene, and we've got suspects A, B, and C. Now, all of these little bands were created from a genetic fingerprint. So what they had to do with this hair, they would have had to carry out PCR on a cell with a nucleus. And they would have had to amplify the DNA. And then they would have had to carry out gel electrophoresis. And that's what's led them to get this banded pattern. For each suspect, they would have had to give a DNA sample, probably from their saliva, and then they would have done the same thing. Extracted their DNA, amplified it, and carried out gel electrophoresis. Now what we're trying to do is see which one is the closest match. So if we look at person A, we can see, yeah, okay, there's bands at the same height, but because in this one, this band's a little bit bigger, and this one's separated out into three in this one compared to this, this means that person A is not a match. Person B is most likely to be a match because their banded patterns match up. So the person is most likely to have committed this crime is person B, and then we just talk about the bands matching up in the genetic fingerprint. So basically, whenever we're answering questions about genetic fingerprints and things, we have to reference the bands in it, and we have to be able to try and compare them. And that's us for gene technology part one.